we're live all right well i was trying to count down to the live but i got this new laptop <laughs> and i don't know how to act now so welcome everybody welcome welcome this is another episode of the full set episode number 23 as a matter of fact i am here with my esteemed colleague none other than tanya denise fields tanya tanya how you doing where you at I'm, I'm home, like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking I'm home violent. with my favorite chair, by the window, listen to, listening to the nigger tree happening yes. down in the corner. When my you was like, they was not floor. playing. I love the nigger tree that happens on your corner because your corner is very unsuspecting, first of all, right? Um, actually, your whole street is unsuspecting. You have to stand still in order to understand what's about to go down on your street. So I will give you that. Girl, it's a mess. It's a whole mess. So I want to introduce you because I'm so excited to have you here. But um, while I'm trying to get ready to introduce you, I want to make sure your payment links is uh, the pinned post. Sorry, the pinned comment because we got to make sure we get some cash in your pocket tonight. No. That's it. That's it. That's it. All right, here we go. I'm trying to start a watch party, but I don't know why it's not letting me. Mm -hmm. Let me oh, here we go. Let me start that right there. Yo, can I just tell you, like, people be making me feel mad hype. Because <laughs> they be like, oh, my God, I'm here. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you make it to? It's just it's just me. Uh, so I want to introduce you because I'm, my life isn't going to be complete until everybody knows what I know. And we're going to get into more what I don't know. So if y'all don't know, which I feel like you should already be following Tanya and they work, Tanya Fields is a mother, a chef, a food justice activist, which I'm going to ask you about because I don't know what that means really, an environmentalist, wow. which I feel like Black people always get the shitty end of the stick when they say environmentalist. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And an all around badass feminist living and working in the South Bronx. Wakanda is... forever. <laughs> I'm like, where have we seen this before? She is passionate <laughs> about healthy living and about making good food and environments accessible to low income and working class Black mothers. She founded a nonprofit called The Black Project, just in case y'all got it twisted, runs an urban farm called Libertad. You, well, you probably don't say it like that. Do you say it like that? We changed the name. The name is now The um, Black Joy Farm. So yes. We're, we're going to edit that. We're going to edit that. And we changed our organization name. It's now The Black Feminist Project. We so it's a, oh, y'all was trying to be, that sounds weirdly specific, but okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> We want to be super specific. So um, you and I are going to chop it up because this is going to go on um, Apple and on Spotify. So I want to make sure it's correct, okay? Mm -hmm. um, do you still operate a mobile produce market called the South Bronx Mobile Market? Yes and no. Nigga, how <laughs> old is this bio? <laughs> Girl, listen. We need you to get you a white person to fix it real quick. <laughs> like, as long as they do it for free, reparation. No, they absolutely will. They're going to do it for Didi. Um, so I know that this is true. You still star in your own cooking show, Mama Tanya's Kitchen. You look like you a good cook. First of all, I know you a good cook, but you look like one too. Thank you. Miss Fields is also a talented public speaker and frequently lectures on food, breastfeeding, mothering, and health. I have the GoFundMe link up and also Tanya's Cash App, Venmo, and PayPal is in the comments. So y'all really have no reason not to donate today. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> donations, 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 more gifts. <laughs> All right, Dr. Dr. Fields, Dr. Umar Fields. <laughs> like, that nigga is ridiculous, ain't he? I'm telling you, I'm the princess of Pan Africanism. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it Donations. here anymore. Donations. Yeah. I don't like it here. No more. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you first and foremost, because I want to keep in with that good juju. It's so comforting to hear you laugh because earlier today, both of us had an issue and we're going to go into that in a second. But what you drinking in your cup? Oh, this is some. I knew you was about to tell me the tea. What is it? Mm -hmm. Some like best value pink lemonade. It smelled like 
It smelled like a um, not a now a Jolly Rancher. So I know it's probably mad sugar in it. I shouldn't be having it. And some Brugal extra. I was Viejo. like, you gotta give me the tea on what's in it. Okay. Extra Viejo Brugal. That's a Dominican <laughs> fucking rum that gets like hair right on your chest. Yes. Right here. <laughs> but it be so smooth going down. It's so smooth <clears throat> going down. You just keep drinking. <clears throat> You're Please like, this is a, it's a little sip sip. <laughs> I was sip sip a little bit. Girl. Little sip sip. So I'm drinking. Um, Crystal Beck recommended this to me. It's called Yes Way Rose. Okay. And I don't really like roses, but this should be having me toasty. So we'll see what happens at the end of this broadcast. It's going to be this, pro- this podcast is going to be called Two Drunk Bitches. <laughs> The remix. <laughs> so so I wanted to ask you because you know, like we launched this podcast. I say we, meaning my team, but really sometimes I mean we, me, I. Um, we launched this podcast um, in the midst of the corona. We was gonna call it Corn Talks. Um, I think I when I had did, and then all of a sudden it became the full set, and I was like, I'm still referring to it as Corn Talks. I like that, you know. I liked I it too. People do corny shit like play off of words and stuff well thank you i you know because i really like jay-z i like double entendres i like triple ones too i'm a poet but the problem with that was i stumbled across some white people so they that's the problem the so it's they, easy to stumble on them because they it's just they were them. just in the way and so you know i was looking to set up the page the quarantine talks or whatever it was gonna be dope and I noticed two white people from Wisconsin had a show, a podcast. It wasn't even a podcast. It was like, we're going to go live once a month during the quarantine to talk about the quarantine. You know how many likes they have? What? 10. Whatever. And they so I was like, I could do this, but I already know no, how fickle white people are. Your name to like Corona crackers or some shit like that. Ma'am. We're- <laughs> Ma'am, I'm never going to be syndicated. I'm never going to be syndicated. (laughs) We about to get banned on Facebook, Didi. You know we stay in fucking Facebook jail. I hate it here. I'm talking about the white people. Gods of the children. Yo, that face, the last time you were Facebook banned, like what happened? These niggas said I was selling pussy online. You was though. It was, it was, was it was an advertisement. It was an advertisement. I was trying to do like the whole like um, artistic, you know, I'm in the tub. What was you trying to do? What were you trying to do? (laughs) Not with the lip though. You was in the tub. I was trying to do that. that. Mm -hmm. And these niggas, the algorithm got me, Didi. The algorithm got me. No racism got you. Out of jail. On some fucking digital (laughs) Asada Shakur. You can't tell the people that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a digital activist. You can't tell the people that. How dare I? How dare I sully? How dare I sully the fucking? You gotta let people think whatever they want to think. By thinking my little 15 day ban is anything close to what Auntie has given us. You know what I'm saying over the course of her life. But you did break me out, and I appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. You know, I didn't shoot nobody for it, but you're welcome. You're right. welcome. Um, yeah. I want to actually ask you a question about that. Like, what's your thoughts on, um, you know, I've been noticing an uptick. I've asked this question before, but I like to ask it of different people because I feel like I'm going to get different answers. What is your thoughts on, there's an uptick of young organizers who are like, Asada Shakur taught me, and, you know, you see it on the shirts and this, mm-hmm. that, and the third or whatever. And I'm like, what did it look like for Asada during that time, during the 70s? Like, no one was claiming her. Like, you know what I'm saying? Well, not many people was claiming her. Our own literally, like, left her in the dust because her actions were so extreme. But now here we have this generation, some odd 35, nay, I say, 40 years later, that is like, nah, Asada taught me. But then these are not the same people that Asada would have taught. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's a, it's a broad question, but hmm. maybe it's super specific too. But I wonder... Like you had said something in your live today and that's what got me thinking about re-asking this question to you. You was like, (laughs) you said some shit about Nikki Giovanni made me laugh. And me and Crystal was talking about it today. You was like, I mean, I love sis, but I don't want to fucking hear from her during this time. (laughs) Like, you know, saying like, so what does it look like when we're in such a radical space or trying to be in a radical space and niggas want to jog for, you know, visibility? Did I say that on my show? 
I mean, niggas should jog. I lost 120 pounds. I'm a gym rat. I believe in um, moving one's body, whether you want to lose weight or not. So we should be jogging. But I think somebody on Twitter, I can't ever keep up, you know, because Twitter should be going viral seven times a day. You can't right. you can snatch it and cut out the person name and act like they made it up. So I don't know who said it is all I'm Please saying. So I, attribution. I do know it was a black woman on Twitter who said, you know, when Eric Garner died, we had shirts that said, I can't breathe. When somebody else got killed, it was hands up, don't shoot. Now we are talking about jogging for Ahmaud Arbery. We are brand ambassadors for our own fucking gap. Yep, you're right. And I think it was really profound. I think in Twitter, there's a lot of self, um, self aggrandizing. And so I everybody, that word. Is, everybody is trying to get that tweet that's going to go viral and, you know, get retweeted, you know, 27,000 times. But what sis wrote was so profound, right? Because it was true. And I was like, this is a perfect example of the intersections of capitalism and activism, right? Right. Like capitalism is so embedded in our very being as Americans or people born in America, because it's very hard for me to call myself an American. Are we American? I don't really have a choice. Right. I was born in America and therefore I have, I guess, American citizenship. Ain't nobody else gonna claim me, but it's hard for me. Like, it feels dirty for me to be like, I'm an American. But anyway, Mm. it's so deeply embedded in us as people born in America or people who proudly claim American um, that we don't even, like, sometimes it's even hard for us to catch that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's even hard for us to catch that thing right there, that we out here creating merch. And yes, people are creating merch and the merch is supposed to be going to fund the movement, but Mm -hmm. it's still merch nonetheless. And so we literally out here creating fashion trends behind the brutalization and death of Black bodies, primarily Black male bodies, which is something else we need to talk about, right? How we can all get together and mobilize behind this myth that it's only black men who are being right. targeted and that black women and black non-men are not also being targeted by police brutality. And that when those of us are trying to say their names, like it's crickets and tumbleweed. Like what they did to Corinne Gaines. Like, you know, like clearly Sandra Bland, niggas was quiet. When I say niggas, I mean black men. Mm-hmm. Um, niggas was quiet and they also- weren't quiet. They weren't quiet. They were very vocal. They were very vocal in blaming her for her death. Let's Sandra Bland? They were very vocal. But it for wasn't Sandra? Support for Sandra. They were okay. extremely vocal. What were they saying? Because I must have missed it. This. They were saying if she was less mouthy, then maybe she wouldn't have got arrested. All right, so Maybe right. if she put her cigarette out, right? What they did is use it as a platform to, to, to illustrate all of the things that are wrong with Black women and essentially right. blame us for our own brutality. So that's where I'm going with this. Thank you for the reminder. Because I thought, I remember very distinctly that year and just feeling like no one's really talking about this. And when I say no one, I mean like all the energy I feel that we put into Trayvon, to Mike Brown, um, to Eric Gardner, all that energy, I feel like no one came out for. So yes, you're right. They were very vocal. There was a lot of critique. That same critique then was held for Corinne Gaines, which I thought would be the crowd favorite because she was a hotep. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I was like, this is your people. And it was like, they could not afford black women dignity, even even someone that shared their ideology to have guns, to be, to be shooting at cops, to be protecting their family. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I thought that this was the Umar generation, right? And so I wonder, like, what is it you know, you run an organization called the Black Feminist Project. What is it that why why even Black feminism? Why is that so important? Because I don't claim I don't claim mainstream feminism. Let me be clear: that first wave, second wave, third wave, wave shit. Where I white hate those feminism. Facebook pages, by the way. They right. share my shit all the time. I'm like, yeah, they share it under a guise of paternalism. As soon as you mm-hmm. tell a bitches to make space and get the fuck out your way and just point you to the resources and 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 and, and leave you the fuck alone. And remind them that them giving you $100, $200, $1,000, $10,000 don't mean that you're going to lick their ass. Watch how quickly they cut you off. Shia's um, mom is watching this and I know she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> um, 
I'm sorry. I have a potty mouth. No, please, by all means. We're in our comfortability zone. So. Um, but uh, I don't claim white feminism. And a lot of times when we say feminism, because white is the default for so many things in this country, that's essentially what it means. That feminism is really a lot of times about how white women can get access to the same resources and be white men. That ain't black feminism, right? And a lot of times I would prefer to use the term womanism, right? Since we talk about Nikki Giovanni earlier, right? Alice Walker, you know, I would, I would prefer to use the term womanism, but I feel like when I use that, I end up in this digression where I have to explain to people right. what womanism is. So for the benefit of people understanding certain vernacular and jargon, I just say that I'm a radical black feminist. Oh, you know, she a feminist? <laughs> what is feminism to you? As someone, and you know, if I'm misrepresenting you, you let me know. As someone who's cash poor, as someone who's dark skin, as someone who lived their lives as a largely bigger woman, right? As a largely fat woman, what does feminism mean to you specifically or someone that looked like you? Oh, God, girl. Well, you know, this is my job. Come on, moderator. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> I was drinking. I've been drinking. I've been drinking. Um, and you also got a flamenco, flamenco next to you. So go ahead, tell me I, about I it. I love this. This is my bitch right here. When I get my talk show, when Mama Tanya's Kitchen becomes a thing, yes, coming with me. I'm gonna get like a big. I don't know if you remember um, uh, Deezus and Miro, their first set when they were on Vice, and they mm. had bad neon in 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 their background because you know they call themselves the bodega boys right so, like that i'm that saying thing. right like i've watched this but go ahead yeah so they have a lot of neon I, I want a lot of neon shit and the flamingo is coming with me i love it i love it um but to get to your question in terms of you know what it what does feminism mean for me I, the feminism for me is not about trying to be a man i don't want to be a black man i don't want to do the same shit that black men do. don't even want to be black men but go ahead right a lot of them <laughs> be a lot of them want to be white women but in any event, <laughs> or be in a white woman, right? Um, but for me, um, let me tag my husband real quick. Go ahead. Radical black feminism is really about um, us being able to re envision a world where black women, right, um, and children um, and girls have the ability to live a life um, of dignity, of safety, and health, right? and where we are no longer oppressed under the guise of patriarchy, mm. and sexism, and misogynoir, right? And I know that 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 last word, that's a mouthful. People are like, misogyn what? Um, misogynoir. Right, mis misogynoir, right? Which is basically misogyny, which is the hatred of women, but misogynoir is specifically the hatred of Black women. Mm. Um, black girls. That's the question um, I have to go ahead. And so for me, it is about us creating and envisioning and creating a world where we are all safe and where we all have the ability to create lives that work the best for us and have access to the resources that give us like a basic like like we get to decide what the like what the baseline for a good quality of life is like a good quality of life looks like this and then despite whatever choices we make, whether we have children when we're married, unmarried, one baby daddy, two baby daddy, no kids. How about that? Two saying? baby daddies. God. Right. You know what I'm saying? Whether we in polyamorous relationships, monogamous <laughs> relationships, no relationship, relationships, queer relationships, whatever it is that we all have the right to have access to resources that give us a good quality of life. And that's what radical Black feminism looks like for me. Thank you so much for saying that. Let me answer the um, phone from my hairdresser real quick. Carlos. Yo, what's up, baby? I'm, your yeah, I'm doing my show right now. Thank you for asking, boo. Thank so you. So no, I know you forgot. It's okay, but I just wanted to let you know that I still need my edges done. Love you, bye. <laughs> it's so important to actually have that kind of conversation. <laughs> so, so, and I know, I know that um we all have small concessions right mm -hmm. that's my small concessions i social distance selectively and that's all i'm gonna say about it people can get mad 
they could write to the show producer, which would be me. And <laughs> you can say what you want, but um, I need my hair done. So there's that. Um, so thank you for asking that question. I want to ask you a follow-up question that I feel like has something to do with it. So a question that I had wanted to ask um, Ijeoma the other day, but we didn't get to it because we were talking about all the things. I want to ask you, and if you don't want to do that labor with me, bye. I love you. I hope you have a good night. Um, if you don't want to do that labor with me, that's cool. Um, but let me know. So you're in a relationship. I am. Your man is fine as fuck. Thank you. <laughs> you fine as fuck. It's a complimentary thing. You know, sometimes people be in relationships and you don't understand what the fuck is going on. I'm right. a big I'm a big purveyor of I don't understand what the fuck is going on here. Right. right. I've been in those relationships over and over and over again. Crazy. So that was my question. So that wasn't my question to her. I'm going to ask you my question to her, but then I'm going to do the two prong question I like to do. So the question I was going to ask Ijeoma, but I didn't get a chance to, but I would actually like to ask every single black femme that comes on the show is, do you think the world will ever provide space for all black femmes to find romantic love? I'm a journalist. This is what I do. I journal. Will the world ever provide space for all Black femmes to find healthy romantic love? Is that what you Healthy says? romantic love. Okay. Did I just throw healthy in there? Did I add that? Did you I did, because I would have never said healthy. Because we can, we can find romantic love. It's nothing. I guess it's that's the two-pronged part of my question. And the find a nigga who's just as broken as you. And when I say nigga, I say that regard to gender or sexual expression, that's all encapsulating. So I am, I'm not speaking just from a heterosexual perspective. I'm, I know, I know, I know you're queerish. I know. <laughs> um, you could throw a stick and find a nigga who's just as broken as you and jump into some codependent toxic shit and be so in love. I mean, I've done it. I've done it right. so many times. So that's my um, second part of the question before you answer that question. Mm. Do you think the men you or the people you dated previously were incels? Were incels? Yes. No, I don't think they were incels. I think they were, um, I mean, they shared um, a similar character trait, which is being entitled despite having done nothing to have access, <laughs> right? To like anybody, right? Um, you know, more especially women, um, right. femmes, um, but I don't think they were incels. These were, these were definitely men who were getting pussy. That was the problem. They was getting too much pussy, pussy right. here, pussy there, and that's all that ever mattered because they were trying to fill, right? We don't talk enough about that. I don't think men talk enough about that. I think women talk about it, but patriarchy being what it is, whenever women start to talk about the things that they've observed about men, particularly when it comes to anything that has to do with a man's emotional well-being, then we're being told we don't know anything. We're being told that we want to turn them into simps. We're being told that we're trying to turn them into all other kinds of pejorative language that I will not use, but usually steps into homophobia and transphobia. And so I don't, I, I don't get into conversations about what's wrong with men. Men need to figure out what the fuck is wrong with them, okay? And then they need to get together and have a fucking conference and figure out how they're going to fix it. But from my observation, since you did ask me, I think a lot of men, like the men that I dated who were out here just with the community cock, you know what I'm saying? With the group on penis. First of all, can we back up from the community cock? Because I've enjoyed a great community cock every now and then. We all have, right? Because that's all they generally have to offer you. Yes, right? ma'am. So yes. they become dick sorcerers. There's a lot of dick wizardry, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Hallelujah. You, you, you know, these are niggas who are wearing phone posits and black Air Force Ones. You understand what I'm saying? Like they don't have any kind of employment, right? They're not even doing a corner boy shit in a way that makes sense. Like they just not in a way that makes sense. Pack. Absolutely. They fucking up a pack. You know what I'm saying? The and weed I, is in the car cracks and crevices, but it's not in the streets. <laughs> right? They fucking up a pack. Um, they out here, you know what I'm saying, living off of women. And the one thing that they think they can give you is seven to 10 inches of some long schlong. And for a lot of women, we haven't done our work around what needs tweaking and attention in us. And you mistaken that, 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 that dick sorcery as 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 something deeper than what it is. And Julie said it was group on penis dick source. 
<laughs> and so it, you know, you staying in relationships longer than you should. You out in these streets looking crazy, trying to fight the bitch with the section eight around the corner who work at the fucking sea town because she been fucking with your man too. Yo man too. Is this a personal narrative? Listen, I might be triggered. <laughs> You taking car rides up to Albany with this nigga mother banging on bitches' doors. I don't go to the school anymore. Right, right. Like you doing all of that. You doing all of that <laughs> because the nigga don't dick you down well. And you mistaking that for something deeper than what it is. Because really, a lot of us get attached to the dick, but we also get attached to the drama. We think that we can heal ourselves by proxy. If you can help mend the broken soul of this very fucked up, right? Like this man is not making any qualms about who he is. He has shown you who he is. You create a narrative around that. Oh, he came from a bad background. He was in the system. He was his hurt as was a, a child. You're right. You know what I'm saying? His, 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 you know, his, his, his daddy did a bid, whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is. My excuse was this nigga's father had a heart attack at a young age. Like what, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> like, I was right? so bad, Tanya, I'm sorry. So, and so you then think, well, if I can fix him, who is in so much of a worse predicament than me, who is so, if I can raise the vibration of this man's, of this very low vibration person, well, then clearly I can fix myself in the process too. But don't, would you agree? This is my would you agree face. Do you see this? My eyebrows have gone up. Would you agree that Black femmes and non-men have been trying to fix ourselves for quite some time. And there seems to be this di distraction that happens, if you will. No, um, I wouldn't agree. You, you wouldn't agree? No. I wanted you to be on my side, bitch. No. Like what? I think recently Tell me, we have recently. started. I think in the last maybe 10 to 20 years, but especially in the last 10 years. You don't think Erica Badu has been trying to work on herself? <laughs> She's not enough woman to divide the pie, bitch. Like, you understand? Well, I was on the Jill versus Erica shit, and she played that song that I used to love, but then it made me cringe when she was talking about you out in the street, your money is not honest, but you taking care of home. And I was like, yo, this is trap queen dressed up as hotep bullshit, right? Fucking Jill Scott's song that put her on the map, right? When she was like, sister girl, honey child. Nah, 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 nah. She talking about fighting this bitch in the street over a man. And I'm thinking to myself. Bitch, you getting in the way of what I'm feeling, okay? Right. You're getting in the way of what, what I'm, I'm feeling. feeling. And I'm saying, no, sweetie. He's getting in the way of what you're feeling. Right. Because nine right. times out of 10, if sis is pushing it that far, he's giving her the latitude to do that. You know, she made a reprise, right? She mm -hmm. was like. This morning, my man exclusively produced me some good extra love. And then she met the bitch at the fucking grocery store. She was like, Raheem, right? And I'm like, we all got a nigga named Raheem, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a nigga named Raheem. I'm not. Mm -mm. My nigga named Mustafa. It's in this. It's in no, this, I feel like that's a good relationship same, for you. It's, it's along the same pro-black Muslim big bearded type. You know what I'm saying? Names. You know what I'm saying? Like that's a that's an extra black name. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel I feel really good about it. I know that, you know, you know, when I think about do like will the world ever provide space? I personally think no. I feel like we're gonna continuously have to fight to carve out space, like, you know, like we're gonna have to fucking NAACP our relationships. And it's, it does start with our relationship with ourselves. Cause I could sit here and tell you as a black feminist or whatever it is I'm doing this year, you know, it's these niggas that's the problem. But I think about how often I allow myself. Mm -hmm. to have my boundaries crossed um how often i <laughs> look at your face you're like bitch i thought about it too i think about how often like you know i pandered i remember like you know sometimes the stories i tell myself about a relationship like oh i sacrificed so much bitch one time i was out in the streets like i don't have my cell phone this nigga had it and i'm dialing on the nine mode you understand what i'm saying like i'm dialing my own fucking number while he with the next bitch, you understand what I'm saying? Like, and that went on for years. Like, and I didn't, 
I didn't know no better because I didn't want to know anything but him. So that was me. Like, you know what I'm saying? But I do think that the, I watch Love and Hip Hop. I know it's a problem that I have. Look at your face. You're judgmental. It's fine. I'm letting you know where I'm at in life, right? I watch every season, every every cast. I'm fit. I just finished up um, Miami. Had already been caught up. I just finished up Atlanta. I went back a season, and I think about someone like Shooter. Shooter had. Uh, you telling me this shit, and I'm like. Doo. Have no idea. It doesn't matter. It's important. Okay. So I <laughs> think of someone like Shooter. This really broke my heart and I wasn't in the situation. Here was this girl that he was dating very seriously, you know, and whatever that means, because he just got out of a marriage. He was dating her very seriously. And she took the time to go take care of herself, went to go get her real estate license and told him, I can't date you because I don't want to be distracted. And this nigga went and took up airs with someone else. And when the girl started dating him again, instead of him saying, no, no I moved on, he was I don't want you know I don't want to distract you. I moved on. He continued to see both of them. It was this huge fight. The two women want to fight each other. This is ridiculousness. And I'm like, this woman's a real estate agent. She has almost half a million followers. Like, and she wants to fight this other girl. And I'm like, is this us or is this them? You know, like I learned oh, by even the examples. An and and I think at the risk of people getting ready to cancel me, the 25 people in my watch party right now, yo, Facebook is on some bullshit. Let me have an emotional breakdown. Maybe like 300 people on my fucking live. Like, Yo, I watched your live this morning and I was like, the numbers are rising. They're like, we want right. to see this bitch miserable. Exactly. Let me be looking like I'm having some fun with somebody else. Facebook be like, suppress that shit. Nobody <laughs> gets the notifications. But to the 25 fucking folks in the watch party right now, um, at the risk of- then it's, then, it's, then it's 55 because I got 30. So we, we doing something. <laughs> At the risk of them canceling me or calling me a pick me show or whatever, we Tell don't. Me. I feel like, and I get it, right? I will lead with there's been so much criticism of black women that I understand why motherfuckers don't even want to entertain this line of thinking that we want to be like the onus is on black men, which it is. The onus is on black men. But just because the onus is on black men doesn't mean that we ain't got some shit that we need to work out as black women. It does not mean that we get absolved of the fuckery that we've gotten caught up in. And I say that from a space of love and holding space, right? Because we have all been, nur nur I'm not gonna say nurture, we've all been raised and survived and are navigating a country that is literally built on our lifeblood, our soul, our sweat, our broken fucking bodies. But I say that to say, you can't then survive that and not have some effects of that and be impacted right. in a way by that. You cannot be in a country like America, which is sick, which is sick to its very core, which right. is rotten all the way down to the roots and not think you're gonna get sick too. That's just not how it works. And so I wanna know where the spaces for, I, I know that we're creating the spaces for us, this is going back to your question from before, being like, you know what I'm saying? Do you know, like, is it them or is it us? And I'm saying it's both, it's, it's both, right? Because so we have it's to both look and? at, yeah, it's like, it's, you know, we, a lot of times act against our own self-interest. A lot of times we will know better and still not do better. I stayed in a relationship where I really fucking knew better. Seriously. He was That's like, this nigga is trash. I love him so much. Right, exactly. <laughs> I made a conscientious decision <laughs> to stay in a relationship with a nigga that I knew was trash. This nigga was basura. I knew it and mm -hmm. I stayed anyway, right? And so when another bitch looks at me and says, I don't feel sorry for you. You deserve everything you get. There is a small part of me that's like, you right, sis? <laughs> like, but that's what I'm saying. Like, okay, so if it's both and when we jump into the conversation about domestic violence, because that's all to me, that's always like a non clemature Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like if a nigga's abusing you emotionally, he's gonna put his hands on you. That's how yep. I feel about it. Straight point blank. And I feel like we need to be serious in our conversations. And you and I had talked about this. Something people don't know about you, Tanya, is that for as much as you shout me out and big me up. I'm bigging you up. This show is about Tanya Fields. Like, you understand what I'm saying? You reached out to me 
nobody knew I was at a low point in my life. You reached out to me and was like, you've come to my events and um, I'm doing this other thing. And I thought of a keynote speaker and I wanted you. Like before I contact anybody else, I want you. And I was like, what's the budget? <laughs> Because I was at such a low point, I was thinking about quitting my job, everything. I mean, every day I think about quitting my job, but it's fine. And you was like, nah, I got you. And you dropped the price. And I was pleasantly surprised because you actually paid me more than white people. You understand what I'm saying? And I was shocked, like, that you believed in me that much. I mean, even though we're friends, you believed in me that much to be like, I already know this bitch is going to bring the heat to Black women. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, but I feel like if I had to be totally honest and transparent, when you brought the panel up after me, this is the kind of space you curate. It's not one bitch is highlighting and headlining the whole show. You was like, everybody up here is gold. You understand what I'm saying? Like, and you brought these women from all different walks of life and they talked about the discrepancies and inconsistencies in healthcare and in city hall and government and just like the representation of black women everywhere in New York City. And I was like, yo, Tanya Fields is a fucking bad bitch. Let me tell you something. And then we went out to dinner, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and we mm -hmm. got some. And so I just want to say, yo, niggas do not know who the fuck you are. I hope they recognize today. I know you have a big following, but I was hoping to introduce you to my following and vice versa, you know what I'm saying? So niggas could see what the fuck I see because I'm like, not a lot of people fuck with me out in these internet streets. And you Girl, do. let me tell you something. When I um, announced you as my keynote speaker, I had niggas slide in and tell me, you know, Didi is a government op, right? You know, you know, she's an informant. And I was like, and I, I remember being like, I, I, I didn't say anything. And they were like, did you hear me? I'm like, what the fuck am I supposed to say to that? Like, like, what am I supposed to say to that? Like, I mean, I guess, I mean, <laughs> Like, all right. I mean, and if that's the case, like her coming to speak in my keynote won't change anything, right? right. Like you ain't gotta throw the baby away with the bath or like oh, I don't know. So even would, if I wasn't operative of the CIA or whatever government agency, you, know, you was still you gonna love on me. Right. Like, I mean, what the fuck would like what I, I mean like the reality though too is like I didn't take it seriously because oh shamel bell like, says i fuck with you thank you y'all come on like now. fucking sean king is out here what pimping, baby. yo my nigga we did sean not even prepare for this pimping, pimping baby he is out here fucking pimping. let me pour some water drink <laughs> he is fucking out here straight pimping black death black trauma fucking Woo! black death porn and niggas, black, white, and everything in between is throwing money at him. Scam after scam after scam. Niggas, fucking Yvette Nicole Brown read that nigga for filth today. You understand what I'm saying? I missed and was it. Like, I was working all day today. And, I and was it. like, I, I am a fucking legal What'd secretary say? by trade. If you come for me with some of that, I'm going to sue you, bitch. Well, I guess discovery is going to get really fucking interesting. Right, like you're not gonna bully me, motherfucker. Right, like my she, she said, hashtag my receipts have hands. Do you understand what the fuck I'm saying to you? This bitch no, said, hashtag wait to see it. Somebody my find the link have hands. Me? Somebody please find a link for me so I could go view it after I get off this I live. I will try to find the link for you because it was a repost of a repost. It was like a repost that got screenshotted. In any event, I say all that to say. I was wondering why all these white people started following me out of nowhere. Like my Twitter's blowing up and I'm like, what? And three token black girls was like, we always give Didi credit for this receipts post. Y'all wrote that shit like a year ago, not even expecting nothing. I was just tired of documenting all the time. Sean King had me fucked up. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm surprised you brought this up because not a lot of people touch the subject with me. So thank you. Listen, I mean- this, What do you say to people who think I'm jealous of Sean King? Jealous of what? Thank you. Jones of what? Nobody with integrity out here doing this work would move the way Sean King moved, right? We already out here in the streets calling him Talcum X. He's very powdery. Right. Niggas is already talking about he is playing blackface. I don't get into that. I don't get into that. I, I know niggas who went to school with him. And when I say I niggas, I mean black men who went to school with him at Morehouse and they're like, that nigga's not black. And I know, you know, I know a lot of people. I don't have no opinion on that. I don't have no opinion on that. I know you don't. I'm I telling you what I know. That. But what I can say is that as a man whose phenotype 
leaves him up to being to having his blackness questioned, legitimately questioned, and is getting paid thousands of dollars to pimp black exploitation. And then nigga gonna come to me and talk about Didi is a government op. If you don't get the fuck out of my face, if you don't get the fuck out of my face. I'm gonna say it one more time, like my I name is Kumar Johnson. I'm gonna say it in triple at if Rainbow's, you don't get bitch. the fuck out of my face. <laughs> like, come on now, like niggas, like niggas is always trying to, always trying to ride the backs of black women. I just a few weeks ago, a black mother lost her child to COVID. She I was her, her need was amplified by a white woman who was her social worker. Okay who had legitimate documentation, I then amplified it and asked other women or people, I actually tagged a bunch of men, none of them that I know other than my, uh, I don't know if I did, none of them that I know other than my man actually sent this woman any, any, any money. That's why I said black men collectively are full of shit. But in any event, why does somebody slide up? Somebody then reposted what I posted why did one of her followers slide in her inbox talking, asking for proof, talking about she's got a friend that's a nurse, like straight violating HIPAA, talking about they couldn't find it. Find what, my nigga? It's only black women that we would ever sit somewhere. And this is another black woman who did it because this is how deeply we internalize anti-blackness and misogynoir. That you would then jump in and think that a black woman was really out here scamming Using the uh, using a fake death of a child to get coins. That white woman was like, "I will send you the documentation." I said, "Miss, I don't care. I don't have nothing to justify to nobody. I vet my sources. the 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 person that's mutuals between you and I is a black woman. I trust her. The person who reposted, I have a certain amount of trust in her. I'm not about to ask." Like, what the fuck? Like, it's only black women that ever got to perform pain in order to get sympathy. And even then, and even then, and even then. So, Dee Dee is an operative. Get the fuck out of my face. Because y'all only do that shit when it comes to black women. It's not the first time that someone said I was an op. The first time I heard it, like, to my face, was on a Facebook post in 2017. And Monica could probably speak to that. Um... Jordan Berg Powers, I'm gonna say his name, um, you know, like I guess made a congratulatory post about like Monica being able to gather 45,000 people together on the Boston Common. And she was like, but you know, Monica's, whatever we go through, Monica's my ace. So she comments on the post, she was like, okay, well, thank you, but D helped. And I see you purposefully left her name out of this. What's up with that? And this nigga was like, I feel like she's on a public post. This nigga got a high position at his company. And on a public post, he was like, she's an op. She works for the government. She's a CIA agent. My nigga, I make, I get food stamps. I'm just, I'm trying to figure it out. I shop at Rainbows. I'm trying to figure it out. You understand what I'm saying? So meanwhile, niggas knew who killed fucking Malcolm X. Let that nigga live in the fucking community and say shit like, well, whatever happened in the past happened in the past, and Allah said we can forgive, and so it's over. Get the fuck out my face. Like, get out of my face. Like, come on now. Like, niggas really ever had a problem with ops. Like, niggas ever really had a problem with ops. They never did. Who was the little Asian dude? You know, I don't want to be anti-Asian, but I also don't care. Who was the Asian dude who was snitching on the entire Black Panther Party? You know what I'm talking about, right? I like, know. he did an expose. If somebody could send me the link, that would be great. He did an entire expose. Like, they found the tapes, like, years later that this nigga was snitching the entire fucking time talking about Asian solidarity with Black folks. Don't get me started, okay? Um, I wanted to ask you, I know that you are a Black farmer. Um... And it's so funny because at the same time that I was fucking with um, certain other farms or whatever, like, and coming across them, I had came across you. I started following you on the internet because of a situation that had happened. Um, I was traveling back and forth to New York a lot. And I think that farm shared your post about your farm had gotten vandalized. And that's when I started like fucking with you, like just on a humble, like, nah, we gotta, we gotta get my situated. I don't know you like, but we gonna share this GoFundMe. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
your your garden it was a community garden if i'm not mistaken like you was taking over niggas was got squatters rights on gardens and y'all was just flipping fucking abandoned vacant lots you know and like can you tell me what happened like was it malicious it i don't know a white puerto rican who is clearly suffering right from substance abuse was we in the hood say he's a crackhead um was just in my lot taking shit did me being a black woman have anything to do with it possibly right niggas in the bronx really be trying to skirt around that black and brown tension in the community latin folks really do not want to talk about their internalized anti-blackness non-black people of color really don't want to talk about their internalized anti-blackness and the ways in which we all be in the same community suffering under the same shit and niggas will look at you Latin ex folks will look you right in your face and treat you like you ain't shit. So did that have anything to do with it? It might have, probably. I feel like niggas was scamming on me for a while. Niggas was definitely scamming. And they were just taking while. stuff from your garden. And you but was using that garden to feed people. I was. I am. And so, like, I don't play. I'm a black woman who be out here by herself. I remember I reading that post, and you was you was so like, I'm not trying to like bring you back to that time excuse me i had a burp i had a little gas but i remember that you was like tight and i'm talking about a bronx bitch type tight you understand what i'm saying like you was like dead ass i'm tight well, like, i was in the middle of the street i went off i was on some fucking who was the girl from bad girls club she was like pop off pop off tanisha yeah, yeah. yeah. I was tanisha shit i was really in the middle of the street i wild out i did i wild out and I'm a black woman who works alone a lot of times. I keep a hammer, not a gun, like a literal hammer. Who you gonna hit in the head with the hammer? Bat, a small Louisville slugger, like the little mini ones. But it was all wooden bat. I keep it under the passenger side of my seat because I've had niggas base up on me. But when a nigga know you about, you really ready to crack a head and defend yourself, it's funny how diplomatic they get. And when right. I say nigga in this vein, I mean black men. And so when... What happened was when I wild out like that, my homegirl, Danya, you know what I'm saying? Who's like mixed, Latin, juicy, all that lives across the street, got a balcony that can see right into the farm. She started being on lookout for me. So when okay. the nigga came back after robbing me the first time, she called me like, Tanya, this nigga's in there again. I said, I'm pulling up, jumped in my car. I'm blowing lights. I already got the back in the passenger seat. I pull up. I don't even, I'm blocking the street. Right. He was deaf. He was deaf. Okay. So he's stealing shit. He don't know that I'm coming into the lot right behind him. Danya at that point sees me pull up like a bat out of hell. She come downstairs. Now here's the shit that's going to kill you, my nigga. You know, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to risk it all, bitch. Come on now. Right. So I fucking run up in there. He can't hear me. I'm yelling and I realize the nigga can't hear me. So I come behind him. I take the bat and push it in the small of his back. He turned around, he trying to talk to me. You know how certain deaf people, talk, like, I think he's totally deaf because the way he was talking to me, you know what I'm saying? I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to imitate him because it will seem like I'm mocking folks and I don't want to be ableist. Right. But there's a certain way that deaf people talk. And so I really couldn't understand him and I don't speak American sign language. So he's trying to talk to me, trying to communicate, but we don't really need to communicate about nothing. Nigga, right. I see you stealing from me. We caught you earlier. I have you on videotape. My girl got you. What the fuck is you doing my shit? I'm taking this back and I'm swinging it. And homeboy is jumping back. My nigga, Danya comes across the street. Danya's like, Tanya, Tanya, chill. Because if you hit this nigga, when they come to arrest him, they're going to arrest gonna be you. It's going right. to be you. And so she's like, I don't want to see you as a black woman go to jail. Girl, why did the corner boys that's watching this nigga take shit out of the farm for the last Look, like I was two happy days, for two seconds. Go ahead. Why they run over? Miss, 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 miss. No, no, no. He deaf. He deaf, miss. I say, yo, this nigga been stealing from me. He's stealing right. from the community. You know what the nigga said? Oh, okay, miss. Do what you got to do. Do what you got to do, miss. And they didn't do nothing? Didn't do nothing. The corner boys. Didn't the corner boys. These niggas could have rocked him. They could have rocked him. You they live on a serious corner. And Danya, by myself, sun going down with somebody that's stealing from me. 
Right. And instead of being like, yo, you really stealing from this lady community garden? Like, you really out here taking shit? This nigga took the eggplants, my nigga. He took the pears off the trees. He took the tools. I mean, he took everything. When I caught him, this motherfucker was literally- So you're saying it's not like he was out here just scouring for food. He's, like, actually committing- Multiple acts of theft because he larceny. came back. Shit went to. She's a grand larceny bitch. Nah, I can't. Who the up now? I it fucking went, guess. Because it went to it went to court. It went to court. Grand larceny. And let me tell you how jacked up the fucking system is. The nigga was on parole. So when he got arrested, he was supposed to get a parole violation and go back to fucking jail. You know, you let that nigga write the fuck out. The nigga came back because you was a black woman. That's why. Right. They let the nigga out. Do you know the nigga came back a third time? I now that's what I remember, and I want to apologize to you because I was like, this shit is not real life. I was like, this girl. I just met you. I was like, this girl is too much. But I seen the live you did right after I said that to myself. This girl is too much. I seen the live you did, and that was a live that had me like. I need to be accountable. I need to do something. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I just want to say, thank you for living your truth. I think that a lot of times, you know, we don't talk about colorism a lot, Mm -hmm. but I want to talk about the fact that that even happened to you in the first place was because you was a fat, black, dark-skinned woman. Number one. Number two, I want to say that the reason that I was like twice in the same month, Monica, like, you know what I'm saying? Was because you was a fat, dark-skinned black woman. And so I will acknowledge my shortcomings and my failings and say, I'm sorry, that's not even something you knew. It's not even something to me that's like, I mean, unless you want to talk about it, but I mean, I apologize because I realize the way that we need to unpack this shit and we say we don't, but we do. <laughs> Nigga, what? <laughs> what we just like? I mean, we needed to have that moment because if I pretend that like, if I pretend that that dynamic doesn't exist, you know, and I get in trouble for this a lot, like, oh, Didi, you got to stop accepting people like, or making their intersections like, you know, the the catalyst for, you know, 100% of your change. To me, sometimes I do, because for me, it's more of a value to be like, I see you in your entirety and I see where like, I didn't see you before because of this and the way I've been socialized. I think it's important as fuck. That's it really makes you get beyond it. Like when you try to talk to gods of the children, right? When you try to talk to the, the, the premium soul teens about the shit that they out here. I was doing. like, who? <laughs> when you trying to talk to the fucking, the, the town clubs and the ritzes about the shit they out here doing. And their first reaction is to get defensive and to act like, well, why is it always about the race card? Da, 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 da. It is. Your inability to acknowledge that these things are happening, your inability to say, these are things that I've internalized, right? And acknowledging it doesn't make me a bad person. It makes me a self-aware person who now understands that I have, now that I've acknowledged it, and now that I'm self-aware, I have to take responsibility for unpacking it, right? Right. That's it. That's how you, that's how you get to it. That's how you get to it. I mean, cause there's this, this whole thing. Wow. This is me drinking. There's this whole thing about believe black women. Right. And then like we start categorizing which black women to believe based right. on the intersections in the first place or whatever. Right. And so at the end of the day, I can't believe be like, believe black women except for this one who's had a lot of traumatic experiences. And even you and I have talked about this. You you cursed me out the other day. You was like, bitch, if I ever became a bitch like you, <laughs> like, you know, and you was like, don't do it, Dee Dee. And I'm, I'm actually trying to, even though I'm being told by my peers that like I do too much when it comes to the quote unquote self-flagellation, to me, it's not self-flagellation. If I'm on the spiritual path and I'm on, I don't want to recreate spiritual trauma that has happened with other people, right? Right. I don't want to create spiritual trauma that I have with Black women who are elders in the community that are like, I've been here for you, but also I'm a Ayanla Van Zant your ass, like, and Mm -hmm. just just break you down to your nothing all over again so I can be the person who's also broken but help you build help build yourself back up. I can't believe I just said that about this, but I love you, Ayanla, but you need some work. So- I say all that to say this is that 
you know, I feel, um, I feel blessed and also there's a heavy weight on my shoulders to make sure that I show up. Like, because what society tells me is I don't need to show up in no kind of fucking way for y'all. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, is that, you know, do you, you the one with the platform, you this, you that, whatever. But at the end of the day, if I don't curate my platform to make sure I'm amplifying the voices of the most marginalized, you talked about this on your fucking podcast, um, your podcast, your live this morning. You was talking about how as a fat bitch, you still fat, but you are not as fat as you used to be. And so there's like this conjecture that happens. Like, you right. know what I'm saying? Yep. And like, what, what is that? What, it, what can you explain to me? Because a lot of skinny bitches be like, oh, but you still a big bitch. You still fat. They could talk about you or, you know, they can't really talk about you. Like, why are you letting them get to you? You fat too. But there's a difference in the privilege you have now. And I'm saying it. I'm 270, but I don't look like I'm 270. I look like a big bitch, but I don't look like I'm 270. So I have to acknowledge that I'm almost 300 pounds, but I don't look like it. And that's all society care about. Pounds. And I've looked at pictures of myself. When I was 300 pounds, I thought I didn't look 300 pounds. And then I'm looking at pictures of myself now. And it could be because I'm projecting. Now right. I look at pictures of myself, old pictures of myself. And I'm like, bitch, no. you don't look like you Bitch, you're pounds. not projecting. You know how many niggas have told you? And I know because... We share the same story. You know how many niggas have told you, girl, you ain't that big. 300 pounds where? You know right. how many niggas have told you that? Because I know I how many niggas have told is, you that. It is it is fat antagonism dressed up in dressed up in a compliment, right? Because somehow being 300 pounds, ooh, so you don't look 300 pounds because 300 pounds is heavy, heavy. It looks like my 600 what, pound what, life. What you know what I'm saying? 300 pounds look like. Right. I'm 197, 199 water weight days, 201 days where I'm fucking drinking all the water, eating no carbs, 187 pounds. I vacillate between that. I don't look, I don't look that either, right? Because I stand at almost six feet tall, right? You a so big like, bitch. What, what did that brute Deuce Bigelow? He was like, that's a huge bitch. I'm like, you right, know, there was like, so what does that even mean? Right. And that's right. when I came to the realization, like I I've, I've had to really grapple with that. I lost 120 pounds. That's a small motherfucking person, right? I lost right. a small person. And because I stand at almost six feet tall, because I am a- How tall are you, stallion? 5'10". Come on, boo. I am solid, right? That's, that's, what, the, that's what our aunties and shit say. Can solid. you just give a shout out to Adora? She another tall bitch. She's six feet tall. All right, Adora. Yeah, I've always wanted to be six feet tall. I'm, I'm, I am salty. That I missed six feet. She's like, I missed that window. I really did. I always wanted to be six feet tall. But, you know, it's like, what, like, I came to the realization, like, Tanya, really, no matter what you do outside of starving yourself or Mm. being on some super rigid, restrictive diet, you're always going to be a big bitch. That is what you are. You are built like a fucking warrior right that's it right like if i think about like the legacy of women that i come from i'm probably some fucking spear chucking gun toting what are you field running fucking warrior farming ass bitch right like i just feel like that is in my that's in my genetic code right like i'm always gonna be big and so it's been very hard for me to unpack what happened is, you know, when I was 300 pounds, fat positive, I'm still fat positive, but 300 pounds, fat positive, there's no equivocating that I'm a fat woman. And I got to ignore my own internalized fat antagonism. Mm -hmm. And now that I was so proud of you when you talked about this, because they don't think if you're a big bitch, they don't think that you could be like intersectional, right? And think about the ways in which you yourself, I when you spoke today, I guess that's why I was so, the more and more like time that like shortened between the time you and I were getting ready to speak, it was like you were doing your live, you do your lives almost every day. Like, and I live for them when I can touch them. You, you said, I worry about everything I eat. So I just got approved for a surgery 
-hmm. you know, I have a heart problem. So it's really imperative for me that I stay around long enough to continue to parent Egypt for as long as I can. And so when I got approved for my surgery, COVID happened. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they was like, all non-essential. I was like, bitch, it's essential. You see me? Like, you know, Um, but I think about it, you know, and you were saying, I did not realize like how fat antagonistic and I had to look at the word antagonistic you know that you are your own worst enemy in your your battle with your body hey booty hey booty Titi loves you you are your own worst enemy with your body you know what I'm saying look at y'all matching this shit come on now come on yama yeah like come on now right I'm telling you yeah, my yay energy all up in here today. I'm feeling it. I, I, I do. I just feel it in my bones today. I really did. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder about that. Like, how did you even come to the realization that the shit that we say about ourselves, because society has taught us how to hate fat bodies, even when they belong to ourselves, right? How did you come to the realization that you was participating, even though like you still a big bitch, you just smaller now, like, you know what I'm saying? How did you realize that, whoa, what I'm saying is going to affect the next person in my life who I love and I care about and is also experiencing body issues, you know, or thoughts about their own body. And is, do I look right at 279 pounds? Like, do I look okay? And then you, as someone who's 200 pounds and 70 pounds lighter, who having been that fat in the first place, like, what is the complexity behind that, T? I don't think there really is any complexity, quite honestly. Oh, shit. I don't think there's any complexity. We all internalize it. And pretty privilege and thin privilege is a thing. Look how like it is. Right. And until it's not a thing anymore, then it will fuel that, right? Like if we all got treated, if we were all seen as desirable, despite the mobility of our bodies, despite the shape, the shape, the shape of it, the size, first of all, let's also just acknowledge that there are hierarchies of fat. We don't even talk about that when we talk about fat antagonism. There okay. are hierarchies of fat. There are little fats. They are, they are, they are big fats. There are super fats, right? There's badly built bitches, right? That's the thing. People say that, right? I hate right. a Bronx bitch. I hate right? them. Like, there's badly built bitches, right? They're proportionate fat bitches, right? Like there is a hierarchy of fatness. Like it's okay to be fat if you got a smaller waist, bigger hips and a flatter stomach. It's not okay to be fat and fat positive if you're fat and you're apple shaped, right? Like we tend to sexualize pear shaped fat people, right? Like it's Shorty one thing- has those apple bottom jeans. I mean, right. like it's one thing to be like, oh, I'm fat. Even when I was at 300 pounds at 5'10, you do carry 300 pounds very differently. And I was still in a lot of ways considered shapely, right? right. So if you're not a shapely fat, the way that people treat you, including other fat women, like all of those things, I mean, it gets complicated in that, just unpacking the ways in which it shows up. But to me, it's not complicated to go from being 300 pounds to 187 pounds and suddenly feeling like you're afraid. Like the one thing that came up for me was just how much the world hated me when I started to realize how even some of the, how my life got easier in some of the most simple ways. Like what do you mean? Not, like people not staring at me when I ate. Mm, okay. Like me Had being, not considered. Like me being able to fit in between two people on the fucking train. My nigga, I agree with that. Okay, I fucked it. Like going into certain places and being able to fit in the booth. How many times I've gone into a diner and the booth is bolted to the wall and to the floor. And, and they don't move. You be like this trying to squeeze and in so there. now I'm trying to literally lift my stomach up over the table so I can slide in. And then you don't tell my, my personal stomach. business on the internet, I'm please. Sorry, I'm telling your business out here. And then push my stomach back down in the fuck. And then pretend that I'm not sitting at this motherfucking IHOP uncomfortable as a motherfucker. <laughs> Trying to eat my fucking Rudy Tootie fresh and fruity, and I can't breathe because this goddamn table is up under my fucking rib cage. 
I'm mad that you said the fruity tutti. So I want to show you something. So this, like, I can't believe I'm showing this. This is my stomach. I have my waist beads on, but they're like tight as fuck because coronavirus or whatever. And I have, I have a B-shaped belly. And I talked about this in a previous interview that I know how to work my angles because I know how to avoid my fatness. Yo, I can't believe I just said that on the internet. And also, I think that it's important to have these conversations. So I appreciate um, you like sifting through your own shit to be like, okay, let's have these conversations. Because I know that once I drop the weight because of the surgery or whatever, that I still have to like take up less space and also advocate for those who are most marginalized, you know? Um, and I think about what you said about pretty privilege. And, you know, I've made a couple of statuses about pretty privilege, but it's a real fucking thing, like, you know? And, and it's because of societal standards of beauty, like, you know? And so how do we as black women who come from all different walks of life combat these two really serious narratives? Like, you know? I don't know. I, I'm, Bitch, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I ain't got the like answer. I got so much shit on my plate and I don't mean to trigger. What you got on your plate? I mean, everything, a farm, trying to trying to 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 elevate a lifestyle brand trying to fucking be fucking rachel ray for cash poor and working class black women you know what i'm saying like you know what i'm saying trying to raise six kids you know what i'm saying just trying not to get killed in the fucking hood trying not to get right. killed when i go out of the hood that i'm gonna I'm a keep it a buck with you keep this it a, keep it 150 dismantling fat antagonism and pretty privilege, you know, I just, I roll it into all of the shit that I do because the reality right. is that it's, it all, it, it, none of this shit happens in a vacuum. Like, even when we're talking about racism, like you said, believe black women, but then we look at who we believe, right? We look at who we believe and we look at who we prop up as the perfect victim. A lot of the times they don't, they look closer to you and not as close to me. You understand what I'm saying? And even you kind of sketchy because you got a wide nose. You phenotypically look black, right? So the reality oh, is- good. Thanks. You do look black. If I saw you in the street and I ain't know your last name- Thanks, don't start. Cause we had a whole post about this and none of y'all niggas who thought I looked black even came out the woodwork. Niggas because was talking listen, about I look black, you know? Algorithms being what they are, I probably didn't even see it, my nigga. But the reality is, until I heard your ass speak Spanish and P.O.P.O. P.O., and then it fucking clicked. Yes, right? I last love name, P.O.P.O. Her fucking last name is Delgado. A dog. Okay, let me let me clear the air about that. We're going to get rid of that, that whole Delgado shit. So not you. I'm not saying you. But my own family members feel some type of way about me changing my last name to Delgado. My name was never Delgado. I can't believe I'm sharing this on the internet. Only my closest friends know about this. I'm telling you, I was born Jamie Denise Irvin. <laughs> like, you understand what I'm saying? Irvin is the ghetto ass last name of my great grandfather, my grandfather, my great grandfather, Leroy Irvin, Clifton Powell Irvin, James Irvin, all them niggas named Irvin. You understand what I'm saying? When I found out how abusive that they have been to the women in our families, this is before I was a black feminist. I was like, I can't be attached to this last name. And it didn't matter anyways. My mother got married. The nigga adopted me. My last name was Robinson for quite some time. It's so funny. I'm such a bruja. I knew that this conversation was going to come up sometime this week. I just didn't know it was going to come up today. My last name was Robinson because I was legally adopted. So I went from being an Irvin, E-R-V-I-N, to a Robinson. And when everything got settled and done, I went to, um, you know, like when you get your first Section 8 apartment or whatever, you got to go through all the paperwork or whatever, right? And I went through the paperwork and they was like, oh, your um, social doesn't match the social security card you provided. And I was like, what? Like, I don't even know what that means. This is a social security card my mother gave me. So I went to the social security office, the Tip O'Neill building in Boston, Massachusetts. And the lady was like whispering to me. She was like, you just have to verify the information that's on the paper. So I verify the information that's on the paper. You know, you scroll down. I never read shit. And that's why I always read shit right now. I scroll down and that shit was like some nigga that wasn't my father that I knew of. 
was listed as my father. It turned into this whole big family drama. I was asking my mother, my mother has since passed, like, what's the problem? Like, why is this nigga listed on my birth certificate with the social security department? And she was just like, didn't want to tell me about it. It wasn't until my mother was sick, you know, that she finally told me like, what's the deal? Yo, I literally severed all ties with my whole entire name. And I went to the last name that only like my family knew about, which was Delgado. Like, you know what I'm saying? I was like, I don't want to be attached to none of these abusive ass. I'm talking about like, if I went into the abuse, this would be a whole nother conversation. Ayala would have to come and fix my life if I talked about the abuse that both my mother and my grandmother went through. And I think about it now, how like a lot of the Black people in my family, who I grew up with, who I'm associated with, I was always raised as Black, be like, oh, you just wanted to be different. Okay, yeah, I want to be separate from you, niggas. Jay-Z do say all the time, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if I don't grow, like, then I'm then what am I doing? Like, what would what, what was any of this for? But sometimes I think about what would it look like if I just, it, did I choose Delgado because it set me apart 20, you know, 17 years ago? Did I choose that? And I don't know, you know what I'm saying? But also I know that I'm on a path or whatever. And so if I need to use it for a smidgen, if I need to use it to get a platform, if I need to use it, then I'm going to use it. Nobody's asking share what the fuck she's using share for. You understand what I'm saying to you? So I will say that. So that way, so my point was that. you look phenotypically black. That's all I'm saying to you. I'm just if saying I, I never heard, heard it before, street, nigga. This there makes is, me feel very warm in the vagina. Now, in my mind, that's a black bitch, right? <laughs> like, that bitch black. And I think a lot of times what happens is our own anti blackness, our own colorism, we will assign exoticness me i'm gonna say you saying this because you're my friend boo i'm not i'm telling you like not you my not friend. look like we could be cousins you understand what i'm saying right you look like my mother i could show you a picture of my mother people mm. used to say all the time when we were younger my kids would the kids in the class would tease me and say your mother fine your mother fine what happened to you and i remember being like 10 being like my mother looks exactly like me except she was your complexion Okay. Like, you know that, I don't know if you um ever listened, back in the day, you know, I was on my fucking neo-soul conscious hip-hop shit. Tell me the I, artist. I played fucking Black Star, the album with Mos Def and Talib Quayle over and over again. And they got that I skit know, from the movie. I can't afford this life. Right, and, and, and they had that skit at, from the movie at the end where it was like, even your conditioning has been conditioned, brother. <laughs> right? Like, I knew that yeah. that was happening. Like, niggas was really telling me that I was ugly, even though I look like a dark-skinned version of my mother. Right? Mm. And so we will see that in our own communities. You will have light-skinned bitches out here who are swearing to God that they are the best thing since sliced bread. And I'm like, sis, you not even cute. You just light. You Bitch, got you're just a loaf of bread. You're not sliced. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You got well, dark like women them. out here, beautiful, Lupita Nyingo, gorgeous, and they feeling down about themselves. This is some shit that I've battled. Even now, on the eve of my 40th birthday, it is sometimes hard for me to look in the mirror and see beauty. And the only thing that's making me feel that way, because these lips, girl, yes. I know these, and these cheekbones, ew. It's because I got a wide nose and dark skin because I've been beat down my whole life for having these two very African features of dark skin and a wide nose. I went through a whole phase for like five years. I was like, I'm getting rhinoplasty. And I is remember- that the, I Is this, that the nose job? Nose job. And I thought I about I it. This Nigerian, for a Spanish looking bitch, I have a very wide nose. So I've thought so about I it. I had a, a Nigerian brother that I was dating at the time and I mean, I ended up blocking him later on Facebook. He was a whole fucking Is misogynistic, patriarchal mess. Um, I guess and, not. but I remember this one thing, listen, even a broken clock is right twice a day. I remember him saying this fucking thing to me. <laughs> he said to me, you look like my aunties and my grandmother back home. He said in Nigeria, you are what a beautiful woman looks like. He was like, you mm. literally wear the face of your ancestors. Would you call your ancestors ugly? And I remember Sam saying that shit to me in that moment and me being like, would I call my ancestors ugly? Would I look in the faces of my ancestors, my great-great-grandmother and, 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 and think that my great-great-grandmother was ugly? 
And so if I can believe that my ancestors are beautiful, then I can accept the, the inner and the outer beauty that I possess as well. And that's when I gave that nose job shit up. Also, as, be, as I became more visible, I knew that these fucking pro-black assholes out here was never going to let me live it down if I went and got a fucking nose job and I needed to be accountable to the fucking... It would be like, all right, little Kim. <laughs> okay, we're all out here on some black China shit. So it's, it's so. wild. It's wild because you can't even be a dark-skinned black woman without living through the same critique that we say that we're not giving to people oh if she changes her appearance so that way she can stop hearing shit about herself right it's anti-black like you know i don't know it's not my story to tell surprise that little kim is out here looking like the saw dummy like what bitch i'm not your friend anymore you called her the saw dummy that was ignorant let me take that back because i fucking love little kim i fucking love i'm so glad we can have these (laughs) check-ins But I'm just, I just, I want to play a game. Like, I'm just saying, like. We're not doing this today. Y'all can't say nothing to me about little Kim because y'all helped her fucking get there. Y'all talk so much shit about her, right? You think about her relationship that she had when she was riding with this fat black nigga who would never get a second look in the street. We were laughing right. his face with the wonky eye, Goofy. all kinds of shit. He and she very was riding eye. with Biggie for God knows how long when that nigga was just Christopher Wallace. And for him to discard her for fucking half Italian ass Faith Evans. What kind of- what, She's what, half what? white? Yes, girl. Yes. That's the other shit too. A lot of folks be out here or some shit trying to, I'm not saying that faith is not black. I'm not taking that what, from I need to know what saying, you're saying. I'm about to eat my Chinese food. Here, and I'm going to say this at the risk of getting canceled. But there be a lot of folks out here who are biracial and they will go harder than the darkest person in the room and seem like they want some shit about blackness. They will fight you if you ever even intimate. <laughs> if you ever even seem to suggest to them that them being biracial or racially ambiguous has something to do with some of the privileges or things that they may have accomplished in life. And then what will happen is weird thing will happen is that folks get tired of that shit. So they'll start hiding it. Yes. Yes. What does that do to the psyche of someone, not just little Kim, but every, every dark skinned woman like little Kim. I think about Kim Whitley, since we are speaking about bitches named Kim, you understand what I'm saying? And there was a show. I don't remember if she was married to a nigga who do hair. I think so. I think that's what it was. She was married to this dude and they went into her house and she had like all serious, like Sambo black art everywhere. And Kim Whitley is my color and have blonde, have the nerd to have blonde hair, which is fine. Cause I might do blonde when I shave my head off. It's fine. Um, And they were asking her about the black art and like, do she feel like she's compensating for something? She's like, no, I'm black. I wanna like, we don't have to go into it, but I really wish that light-skinned black women who are black could own their blackness without shitting on actual dark-skinned black women. Like, you know what I'm saying? Without it, with, I won't say without, reel it back in, with acknowledging that their place in society so adjacent to a white ass table, right? Is literally because they're propelling themselves off the backs of black women. And people can, we talked about today, I was on a phone call today about performative activism. If my activism is performative enough to make you think, then it was the performance that you needed to see. You understand what I'm saying? Like, that's just how I feel about it. And so I thank you for being open enough to have this conversation with a light-skinned bitch like me, regardless of what you think my phenotype is, I am a lighter-skinned bitch. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I thank you personally for having this conversation with me. I want to ask you about friendships. Um, And then I want to ask you about your farm. Farm and friendships, friendships and farms. Nigga, do you have friends is what I want to know. Friends. How many of us have them? Friends. Sorry, I'm dating myself now. I'm dating myself. I told you I was almost 40. I'll be 40. Do you know the dance though? You're not dating yourself unless you know the dance. No, nah, I don't know the dance. All um, right, then you good. You good, you. Um, do I have friends? 
I do. I do have friends. I do be missing like having bug out friends though. I be missing having bitches that could just come over and hang. And the bitches that I had that would just come over, come over and hang, drink with me, whatever. A lot Let of me times, finish this fucking bottle. I'm not talking to you no more time yet. I'm uh, not doing a that. lot of times, it's bitches that didn't have kids. You know what I'm saying? And I think it started to feel swept up in all of the chaos and I guess drama of my life. Um, I don't know. I also feel like I'm a lot. I'm a lot. Um, and I feel like women like us who are a lot, who say the things that other people are thinking, but don't want to shoulder the blowback of actually saying it, right? Or take ownership over saying it. Um, I think we have to get used to being our own best company. I think that's something that I'm starting to resolve as I move into my 40s and into what the aunties tell me, me as a as an upcoming auntie, as the older aunties tell me is the phase of just not giving a fuck when you have no more fucks. When is your birthday, boo? September 3rd. You a Virgo on a purpose. Virgo. Yo, yeah. you got a love letter and I wasn't going to share it with you, but I'm going to tell you real quick and we can go back to the conversation about friends because I feel like this con- this love letter that came to me, it came to me while I was watching washing clothes and a friend of mine, she's a very good friend. She was like, I don't know, Tanya, but I fuck with her and I fuck with her in the long way, like she could say anything. And I would be like, bitch, yes, you said it. I know it to be true. And I was like, you should write that to her. You should tell her right now. She has such a shitty day. I said, you should tell her right now that that's how you fucking feel. And she's like, I'm gonna do it. But you know, this bitch got like 10, 10 kids or whatever. So maybe she didn't have the opportunity to do it. Cause I know she ain't right to you. I already know my friend. And she was just like, no, she just so fucking raw and so fucking real. And when I think of a bitch like you, I think of a bitch like me. I think it's weird for me to have friends. I think I think we have to redefine what friends mean, though. I think I don't want to do it. I don't want to do that labor. I feel like especially it's not labor, right? I think what the fuck is it? I don't think it's labor. I think it's resolution. I'm gonna really slap the shit out of you with you and them noodles. You irking my nerves, nigga. It's low main. How can you get high without low main? Killing me with this fucking low main. But I think it's about just resolving some shit. I think especially for women, we are fed these images of like waiting to exhale and all of this like- Bitch, I'm not talking to you no more, it's It's over. Five of us and we supposed to talk all- And that's like, we know that that's not really how life is. I mean, even those of us who wouldn't consider themselves to be too much, those of us who are easygoing, you got a kid, a couple kids, I got six kids, you got- fucking work i know mothers who are stay-at-home mothers you understand what i'm saying and they still be having to schedule conversations like shit out here just like life is a lot capitalism be running us ragged right and then you put the intersections on top of that of trying to navigate capital well, niggas don't want to talk about intersectionality okay you know what i'm saying that the 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 bitch you live in the bronx for real i heard okay. it and yeah, girl. And I live across the street from the damn firehouse. It's, just, it's always cracking. It's always popping. I think you have to see, like for me, a friend is someone where you we've established enough mutual trust between each other that I know I can tell you some shit that maybe I've been going through for a minute and you're going to hold space for me. For me, a friend is someone who is going to lovingly pull my coattail and ask me to be more accountable right? In some ways in which I'm showing up in my life. Friend is not, I think a lot of us sometimes confuse friends with a bug out buddy, right? Somebody we can smoke with, drink with, go to club with, go to brunch with. I know bitches like that. That's cool. I'm not going, I'll be keeping it light though. You know, a lot of times, you know, I'm an Aries ascendant. I show up like an Aries. Like when Mm. people find out that my ascendant is Aries, Niggas be like, oh, it makes sense. Cause I don't really present as a Virgo. I be with the shits, right? And Virgos take like you ready before. to pop off. We was right. in the grocery store and he was like, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> Virgos tend to be more standoffish 
And I have that, right? Because even in my present, even in my approachability, I'm a standoffish person. It takes me a long time to tell you anything really of depth about myself. Even on here, my 24,000 followers, niggas think they really know me. Oh, you so raw, you so real. Yeah, I'm telling you the broad stroke of shit that I think resonates with all of us. I'm not getting into the itty bitty details. There's so much shit that happens to me behind the scenes that I never tell y'all bitches and I would never tell y'all because I know how people weaponize shit like that. I've had friends who have weaponized shit that I've told them. I've had friends where I wasn't smart enough and discerning enough that when that motherfucker was always bringing me hot tea, it didn't click to me that they're gonna carry hot tea. You understand what I'm saying? If you bringing me hot tea, you the nigga that carry hot tea. When I got a phone call a couple of weeks ago with somebody asking me about something, about two other people, and I had to, from jump, I had to be like, listen, I'm uncomfortable in this conversation. I don't do this. What Are I can encourage you- Are you put up boundaries or no, not yet? What? Are you able to put up boundaries or no, not yet? I still struggle sometimes with boundaries, but it's easier yeah. for me now. I'm very intentional. I give myself pep talks. When I know something is happening, because I'm a person who deals with trauma by fawning. So I don't know if people know what that is. When you fawn, um, which is a lot, which we've identified as a trauma response, some of us know it as people pleasing. You become okay. a person who always wants to please people, who will go out of your way to do things, even when it's at your own personal expense and even when later you feel resentful about doing it, right? But you said you were going to do it and you want this, you want validation from this person, so you're going to do it anyway. It's called fawning. And it is a trauma response. And it's a trauma response in people who have attachment issues. I have big attachment issues when it comes to my biological mother, right? Um, that shit, that a lot of it stems to me wanting to to it makes me feel like i have to perform perform for people's love right and through years of therapy do you feel like you have to perform for your mom's love i know you went to go see you know your parents the other day uh well when i talk about my mother i'm usually talking about my stepmother if you hear me say my biological mother well then i'm talking, You're talking about, about your birth mother. mother yes um i don't feel like i need to perform for her anymore that's why she and i don't get along right because I was like, miss. I think that that's so brave of you to say I have so much unresolved trauma with my mom's. Like, my mom's was dope. But my mom's is also an asshole, too. And that's drunk DD talking, but it's real. Um, but I just want to say, like, the shit that you talk about on your lives, I appreciate that you're saying, like, it sounds to me like, you know, sort of like the same vein as Feminista Jones. That it's real as fuck that you don't have to share your deepest self with the internet. You're sharing, you're curating, you're sharing what you want niggas to know. And at the same time, the vulnerability in which you expend to us, I do feel like sometimes we don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. We get a look into your life. You know, I think about your New York Times article. It's not the first time you've been in New York Times. My nigga's popping. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it's not the first time you've been in the NYT. What I'm saying to you is, is this the first time maybe that, like, someone covered a story that you was facing? You know, you recently been afflicted with COVID. You know, your entire house was just, like, on lockdown. You was like, this is what we got to do. And niggas, I still got to go to the grocery store because who's going to feed my family? You know what I'm saying? New York Times covered it. It was a beautifully written piece. Mm. and black people white people uh, but i'm not here to talk about them mm. our own came out and was like oh you shouldn't have had so many kids oh you know and i think about like if i had kids i wouldn't have got the virus the fucking and that's the thing people don't people have a tendency and i think because capitalism doesn't allow for us to be people of multiplicity and i think again it's like Pee Wee's Playhouse. Every time I say intersection, all the furniture are gonna start yelling and shit. Ma'am. Okay. <laughs> like, the, when you intersect that with the ways in which it has diminished how we see the humanity of other fellow black people, yeah, it flattens you. So, niggas don't even care that the article was about Corona, about COVID-19. Niggas was coming and I could tell you didn't watch the video. You didn't read the copy. You saw dark skin, black woman, Bronx, six kids, and that was it. That became the totality of who I was. That's it. 
I've gotten very used to that. It used to bother me. Tommy Sotomaya done made videos about me. I used to have, I have a very firm, like not accepting black men um, friend request. Oh, right, um, right. Unless like I like know people who know them and we've been in certain spaces and even then, right? But for the most part, back in the day before I had that rule, that rule came up because black men would send me friend requests. And then I would find out later that they were snatching pictures of my kids or snatching pictures of me and mocking me on their pages. Like, you know what I'm saying? So like, you know, I got thousands of people in the friend request queue. I have a public page. There's nothing that I'm saying publicly. Like there's nothing that I'm saying that you going that you gonna miss if you're my friend. Right. right. So a lot of times I just don't accept people as, as my friends, just as a way to try to like protect myself um, because I have been so abused online. And that is what it is. I'm going to call it what it is. Yeah. I don't know these people personally. I don't have, a, I don't have any established relationship with them, but when you do abusive shit, call people names that you don't know, you know what I'm saying? Snatch people's pictures of their children, call them souvenirs. That's why, little, yeah. Souvenirs or little bastards. Like, this is shit that people have actually said about my kids. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? These same people who swear to God they pro-black will go out here and call black children little bastards because their black mother, their dark-skinned, fat black mother had the audacity to not marry their father. So, like, yeah, I've gotten used to it. Like the New York Times article came out and I got caught up in arguing with a couple of folks. And I was like, you know what? Fuck y'all. You didn't read the you didn't read the copy. You didn't watch the video. And motherfuckers like you, what the fuck I look like wasting my precious ass, finite ass time and energy arguing with a motherfucker who's already decided that they're right and already decided that bitches like me don't deserve any fucking grace. I'm not arguing my goddamn humanity to another motherfucker so long as the day that I live. This is not happening. How did you come to the realization that a bitch like you deserves love? Mm, I think we all deserve love. So I was just like, you know, that includes me too. I think women who look like me especially deserve love. Women like me especially deserve love. I mean, women like me, you know how many times women have called me, black women online have called me a mammy because I got six kids, a breeder, a mammy. And that word is so overused. And I don't necessarily want to- To me, it just means something different. But to you and your experience, it means this. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's for me, what I want, I agree I want with you. Us, I don't want to necessarily know if I want to reclaim the word, but right. I feel like the word is so overused. It's, it, it's become a pejorative. And much like Uncle Tom. When you say pejorative, I squirt every single time. So say it again, please. <laughs> I think much like Uncle Tom, niggas have no historical context of where it came from. They just say it, right? Bitches who look like me, who were relegated to the mammy role, right? Like I have six kids. Like if, if I had to time warp and I was back in the fucking antebellum South, Right. I would rule the fucking field. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'd work right. in the house and I'd rule the field. Six kids, wet nurse, fucking cook. Like, I, I'm, I'm the mammy. I am the mammy. And I'm the motherfucker who kept you alive. I'm the motherfucker that raised the whole community of motherfuckers. Right. When your parents got sold off or you got abandoned, I'm the doorstep that you came to because you knew Auntie Tanya was going to feed you. That's how Mama Tanya actually came up. Mm. I had a lover who would talk about how fucking, he would be like, you a fucking super African. He was like, you just, you just too much. You just too much. He was like, you feed the people, you take care of people. Like, he was like, you, like you, Mama Tanya. He started calling me Mama Tanya. And then as a joke, I started saying that before you knew it, everybody else started saying it. Right. And so while I don't necessarily know if I want to reclaim the word mammy as a compliment, I think we do a great disservice to the historical legacy of mammies when we use it in that way. The same way motherfuckers talk about Uncle Tom, but they fail to realize that the reason that Uncle Tom got locked up, chained, beaten was because he refused to abuse another black woman. Because you know what? Niggas never actually read Uncle Tom, but I have. I was about to say, I never read Uncle Tom. Niggas never actually read that fucking 
450 page, 500 page tome called Uncle Tom's Cabin. They just know a white bitch named Harry. When you said Tom, I squirted again. It just right. happened. They just know Harriet Beecher Stowe, a white woman, wrote it. And I'm not saying it is not without criticism, that's not without problematic. But the one thing that I think motherfuckers forget about that book or they don't know about that book is that fucking Uncle Tom refused to beat another slave. He was beloved. And when he resisted, in beating another enslaved African, a woman, that is when they started to abuse him. Why do you we think Uncle Tom? If, no, that's. I feel like you just educated me on something, and now I feel compelled to fucking download the now, mind you, In twelve years a slave, fucking what's his face, the main character, he 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 beat Patsy. He beat her. When it came time to choose between him. And then was like, that was such a good movie. <laughs> he beat Patsy. Right. He beat her. And then at some point he was like, okay, this is enough. I won't go any further. But he wasn't willing to take the lashes. So he beat Patsy. Uncle Tom did not. So I'm just saying. So you have a tender spot for Uncle Tom. I don't know if I have a tender spot for Uncle Tom. I'm just saying that a lot of motherfuckers pick up terminology introduce it into the mod the, the 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 modern day lexicon and don't actually have any historical context of where the fuck it came from that's all i'm saying i'm gonna sit with that that's actually a valid point and i'm uh i'm definitely gonna like sit with that critique because i have not read it because of everything i've heard about it even as a young child i was taught as a black girl that this is not this is not this is not even literature because this is about selling out. Like, you know what I'm saying? I was always taught that. I grew up with hoteps. I'm half hotep, Egypt's a quarter. You understand what I'm saying? So I appreciate, no, I really do. Y'all know you like we kiki with each other, but I appreciate you giving me that perspective. I'm gonna sit with that and I'm gonna actually read the story now. So um I'm gonna just comment that for folks who are asking, thank you, Aaron, for uplifting that for folks who are asking tanya's gofundme cash app venmo and paypal is here as a pinned comment all you want to do is scroll to the top of the conversation boom it's there dripping like pear juice it's about to be lit i want to talk about your farm because you talk about food justice eh, eh, eh. and i'm like when i think about food justice i think about the fact that i actually enjoy gmos this and a third i'm not a vegan i'm not anything like that but there's an important conversation that, that is happening with food sustainability, especially during this time that we're not having. And I want you to speak to that if you could, Tanya. What am I speaking to? Like what is- Nigga, I don't even remember the, what the question hey, was. Like, you understand what I'm saying? Context, but I don't know what the question is. <laughs> the question is why, okay, the question. Wow, I just be, it's not that I be pulling shit out of my ass. I have told myself I'm gonna stop saying that. It's that my ancestors be like, bitch, you already know you're getting fucked up. So the question is, thank you, mom. The question is, is black farming. You know, I've had this topic on my show before, but if I had to put it in context when I say black farming and food sustainability, you not the bitch they write. You are the bitch they write the narrative about. You understand what I'm saying? You are, and I have wrote this, I had updated my Facebook page actually with, you know, people like you, people like me and mine, that at the end of the day, if we not one paycheck away, we still in the same situation. Like, you know, we out here advocating for the most marginalized and we are the marginalized and we are the experts on what black poverty looks like, right? So when you, a black femme, black feminist, right? Black radical feminist say to me, nah, Dee, I'm out here on my black joy farm. I'm out here doing food sustainability. What does that mean to a bitch who be like, beans and grits is the way to go? Beans and grits are the way to go. I know. I don't. I don't have. I don't shit to say about that. Beans and grits have fed us for generations. I mean, I feel like food justice needs to be recalibrated. The lens through which we talk about food justice and food sustainability is a very like homogenized white western lens and let's be very clear black folks indigenous folks taught motherfuckers in this country how to eat okay like thanksgiving is really just about how fucking indigenous folks 
kept these fucking pasty ass colonizers from dying and they yeah. turned around and, and fucking the gave them <laughs> turn around and gave them diseases and killed them right fucking when black people when africans had to brave the fucking transatlantic slave trade when they knew that they were being captured to be sent to some foreign land that they had no idea they were going to what did black people do they hid the seeds to the things that they ate in their hair they literally put the seeds in their hair do you understand? Like food was so important. Keeping a connection to our cultural food pathways was so important that even in the midst of being fucking brutalized and kidnapped, motherfuckers were putting seeds in their hair. And so when we think about food justice and we're like quinoa and vegan only diets, and I'm not shading any of that because- I quinoa told you already today, actually, don't come for the motherfucking quinoa, quinoa bitch. Quinoa is an indigenous food, but Thank I'm just you. saying a lot of times we, we hold that up only because mainstream white, folks. white narrative says this is the new superfood. They bastardized your food, told you it was peasant food, and then turned around, commodified it, and sold it back to you as if they had some brand new fucking idea, right? Like, I grew up eating mustard greens and kale. I fucking hated kale. And then all of a sudden, 10 years ago, Rebecca and them started talking about how kale was a superfood, and I watched the price of kale jump up triple fold. When kale was one of them things you could go into the grocery store and get for mere nickels. And all of a sudden, a couple years ago, I'm seeing like Bone Petite or, or, or Foodist or whatever, they talking about mustard greens, right? And they're talking about it as like some sort of micro green. Bitch, mustard greens is like what my fucking Southern ass country family ate with some fucking some some smoked turkey neck or a lot of times it was it was um uh hog maw or or what's the other one that we ate um ham hock that was a whole fucking meal i was gonna ask you do you think okra is a super green I think okra is nasty, but I grow it. You up mind your <laughs> fucking business about my fucking okra. I'm, I'm not talking to you for nasty. the rest of the year. I think okra is nasty, and I got five fucking flats of it at my farm right now because let I let me get a box. I'll drive down to the city right do now. Fucking African, not only do descendants of Africans love okra, the Caribbean <laughs> love okra. Fucking Dominicans yeah. love okra. Puerto Ricans love okra. Bitch, Mexicans you know, I'm fucking okra. 27% Nigerian. Let me tell you something. I fucking went to the food bazaar in my neighborhood, okay? It's fucking mad, mad, mad Latin people. They're like, keke. You understand what I'm saying? I'm in there looking for, this is when the fucking pandemic first started. Everybody panic buying. Nigga, why was fresh okra out? I'm asking a little Mexican man, y'all got any okra? He like, oh, mommy, I think we out. I think we out. Fucking the hood bought up the okra. So I think okra is nasty and slimy. I will eat it in gumbo, but that's only because it's like shrimp and chicken. In some cultures, they call it okra in gumbo. Like, yeah, in Spanish. So, yes. so, um, what? Tomatoes what? Oh, Mustafa said the trick to making it not slimy is tomatoes. I don't care. I don't like it. First Not of all, okra. nobody's putting tomatoes with okra. No, unless it's Indian people, like Eastern Indian people. No one's doing that. So nobody asked him to bring his recipes. I wanted to ask you, what's a recipe <laughs> for kale? What's my recipe for kale? Yeah, I because my nigga, I struggle with kale yes. tremendously. First of all, I like baby kale. That's it. I don't like- the Little tiny food. babies? I don't like fully maturated kale. The bigger it gets, the more- When you say maturated, I just- <laughs> The bigger it gets, the tougher it gets, like arugula. Most right. people eat arugula. It's very bitter. And it's bit like they have baby arugula because full-grown arugula is fucking bitter. It's the same thing with kids. Who's eating full-grown arugula? You know niggas I mean, that eat full-grown arugula? No. It's, it's all right if you tell me you have some friends that are black vegan. I'm not going to judge them. because it's mad peppery and it's, it's mad bitter. Nobody. That's why they eat baby arugula. That's why we just right. call baby arugula arugula at this point. But kale, I find one, if you're trying to get used to kale, 
um, first of all, Mustafa, just to Jamila Duncan said tomato and okra is the bomb, and Jamila is mad fucking trini. Okay, so it's not she's not East Indian. She's a little she, Indian. She's trini. If she's trini. She's, she's a coolie. No, she's a little she's Indian. Like the same motherfucking complexion as me. She's all African all day, every day from the island of Trinidad and Tobago. So she said fucking okra and tomato is bomb. And my father's from down south. And I didn't want to say no, I was going to let you rock, but he eat tomato and okra too. So it's a thing and not just for the East Indians. But in any event, um, baby Kale, if you trying to transition- Yo, you look family, fly as fuck. Why are you show us the thigh right now at this moment? Go ahead. Tell your story about the baby Kale. If you're trying to transition into Kale, baby Kale is a nice introduction. Okay. Right? If you grow it and you can grow Kale- in your house, if you got a heating lamp, if you got a fire escape, if you got any window that gets direct sunlight for at least six to eight hours, you can grow kale. And when you get a plant that's about two to three inches tall, that's baby kale, you can snip it and eat it, right? The other way I like kale is that if I need to eat it raw, I will marinate it. Or as my friends in Baltimore like to say, like I marinate it. I in the, marinate it. In the chicken stock, right? I know I make a yogurt based dressing. I actually have a recipe. Um, if people follow Mama Tanya's kitchen, I was about to, to ask you, her. you need to teach me to cook, bitch. You did this coquito. So I'm not even Puerto Rican. It doesn't matter. But every single nigga I've been married to for like the last 20 years has been Puerto Rican, right? You did this Puerto Rican coquito, but it was like vegan. I was like, I'm, nobody's drinking this shit. And I went to your um, sis do you dinner. Yo, I literally was like, yo, let me take your cup. <laughs> like from Ada, who was sitting next to me. Yo, that shit was clutch. I don't know what you did. Maybe you use coconut milk. I don't know, my nigga. Like, but that shit was buttery. It, it tastes like butterscotch. You did all the right things. I feel like if you have not dropped a recipe book, you got to beat this bitch prima donna out from Love and Hip Hop Miami. You just got to beat her out the water. Nobody cares about her shit. You got to put this coquito rest uh, recipe in this fucking recipe book. All with your other shit. Because the dinners that I have eaten twice now at Sis Do You. I take a lot of pride in the... in in Because for, for me, food is 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 love, right? There's so much of our, for those of us who may not have any historical context, for those of us who have been denied access to these spaces to even, to even spark the desire to educate ourselves on where we've come from, food still holds that story. It still holds that narrative. And even if you don't know, as long as as long as you have that, you know, as, as long as we have that, then we're still keeping those traditions alive. I remember when, you know, my my ex, uh, my kid's father um, was a corner boy, a bad corner boy, a very bad corner boy, the kind of corner boy that fucks up a pack. Um, and um, I remember, uh, you know, when one of the homies would die or something, they create a shrine in front of the bodega on the corner in front of the building and they would pour out a little liquor. And I remember telling them that they were doing what we've always done in honoring our ancestors in the act of pouring libations. Yo, when I tell you Dee, Dee these niggas really was like, nah, miss, nah. And I had to go on Google and I literally showed them on my phone the act of pouring libations. I showed them Baba Laos and priestesses on African soil in Nigeria and Mali and in, in Ghana pouring libations and speaking in their own tongues. They could not believe it. These are corner boys. 21, 22, 25, 30 years old. And they did not realize that they were connected to the motherland and connected to their ancestors by pouring out a little douce, by pouring out a little Hennessy. They didn't realize it. But our body remembers. The body remembers. The food tells the story. Do you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So for me, that's what food justice is about. It's about keeping those pathways alive for us, not some crunchy ass 
fucking wheat germ fucking version hemp version that western european society is trying to push on us i am talking about the fucking motherland indigenous traditions that live in our fucking genetic memory that's food justice Woo! baby what a definition i hope when this this podcast replays itself if you didn't already have what you just said written down in the chunk that you did that you published that shit and you be like and whatever y'all thought about food justice before, this is the definition. Like niggas, what I claim right now in my own manifestation is that niggas and white people are like, who knows, are literally going to be like, and this is the definition of food justice that we utilize. You, know? <laughs> you really think fucking... My nigga, yes. You, I don't fucking, give a fuck. you think Marion Nestle is about to be like, it is not some hemp, <laughs> weed germ, Rebecca yes. version... Yes, I don't know. Last time when I that. said I'm claiming it right now, 5 11 2020 at 9 50 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm claiming it in real time. What I will say to this, and so niggas is agreeing with me. I just looked down at the comments. Niggas is agreeing with me. I know I'm not crazy. I did my reading with Fire Angelou today. I know I'm not nutty. I'm a little nutty, but I'm not that nutty. I know what I'm talking about. Um, Leah C.K. Lewis said, um, Please write that down. Niggas is like the DNA remembers. Crystal Beck was like the DNA remembers. Nigga, like what you just said was a whole fucking sermon. And Sunday was yesterday, my nigga. You understand what I'm saying to you? I hate your ass. Like, damn, you could have saved. <laughs> you could have saved this for yesterday. But I'm so grateful that you came on the show. One last thing I'm going to ask you about. Because I'm really trying to be cognizant of the time. I right, really you got nine it. minutes. I got a room to clean and some food. No, it's eat. fine. Because we talked about the hypeness. Salmon. We I talked about the hypeness of the girl. whole thing, right? So I finished the whole bottle of Guess Way Rosé. And so that's how I know it's going to be a good evening today. That is a poem. And so what I want to say. <laughs> what I want to say to you is this. Is that I appreciate the time that you spent here. There is a question that I ask each and every single guest. I feel like I could talk to you all day. The other day we was on the phone two and a half hours. I could talk to you all day, but there is a question that I want to ask you. I know that you have a couple of things before I go into the question. You have a couple of things that are coming up. Mm -hmm. On May 15th, you have a volunteer day at the farm. And a lot of a lot of people you would like to see, I feel like you would like to see anybody come, but you would prefer to be around skin folk. Like, you know what I'm saying? Volunteer day at your farm. And you will, if people are interested in joining this volunteer day, is in the Bronx, is dope as fuck. I have not been to the farm yet. We're gonna feed we'll people. We're gonna feed people. We're gonna turn on the grill. We're gonna feed people. Is all I'm saying. I can get my popcorn machine. We'll make popcorn for the babies. That's um, that's Friday, May 15th. Friday, May 15th. People have to uh, register um, because uh, at any given time, we cannot have more than 10 people in the space. It's a 5,400 square foot lot. We will have to observe social distancing. There will be stations that people can help volunteer at. Even if folks just want to come with their kids and just be in a safe space where they can sit outside, we know that like unpoliced space is really at a premium right now and mm. i really even if you just want to with your kids and just sit on the bench and watch the rest of us work i'm probably going to judge you a little bit but not too much because i understand you know what i'm saying <laughs> um, if you want to come and help us plant we got 1400 dollars worth of plants that need to be put in the ground and we got to clear the beds you know i'm mean? having a soil delivery etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you want to come and do that work um we will do that we're going to do temperature checks we're gonna give you masks. We're gonna give you gloves. Yo, you a boss bitch to be COVID informed, trauma informed, and also doing like still doing the work that the community needs. Cause you run this farm off of your labor of love. Mm -hmm. um, also, I see another thing you got coming up, you know, cause I work off of paper mm -hmm. is you on May 27th, you got Do You Sis. Do you wanna explain a little bit about what that series so is? Our, our Sis Do You dinners were in-person dinners. We clearly cannot do them anymore right now, given the circumstances. So we are going to have sis do you digital dinners. 
They will be probably in like the Google Hangout or the Zoom platform. Like you, I'm looking to find a tech person who can essentially facilitate the tech piece of it. I'm so gonna help anybody, you. Anybody- You already got that. I'm gonna help you. Got you, boom. Um, and we will have up to 50 participants. The first um, 20 folks will get um, dinner money, which is we'll give them a $20 thank you so that they can order some Uber Eats. Our menu will be the themes of that day. So we will turn our menu items, like if we're gonna have cornbread, it will somehow be representative of a theme that we're gonna talk about that night. And it will be two hour dinners with facilitated guests and panelists um, that uh, specifically for teen girls ages 14 and young women ages 30. So from 14 to 30, women, femmes and non-men only. Um, and so folks have to register for that. The first 20 folks to register and show up in the dinner will get some, will get dinner money. Um, and uh, so that's what Sis Do You is about, right? So we're gonna continue that platform. Um, and, then, um, and then on uh, the 29th, I believe, Friday the 29th. Yeah, that's what I have written down, the food yeah. box, right? We're gonna we have, we will be launching our Corona um, uh, food, uh, Corona relief food box. Um, 50 families every, every week. Um, we are asking 25 folks to subsidize another 25 folks. So we're asking 25 people to buy a box. How and many you got right now? Box will subsidize boxes for 25 other people in the community who might be, um, who might be experiencing some food insecurity um, because we know grocery stores out here right now are, are, are exploiting niggas. Like there's no sales. I've not seen one sale since the pandemic started. There are no sales. And I've talked Got to it. other people, there are no sales. They're, they are selling old food, at least in my community. Quiet is kept. I went to, I was about to say quiet is kept. I went upstate to a very popular grocery store, chain grocery store uh, in Scarsdale. And these niggas were selling old food. Like I've shopped there before. I'm not gonna say no names because them niggas got big, big lawyers and I don't want no smoke. But all I'm saying is a very popular chain that the hipsters like upstate in Scarsdale. Bitch, if you wanna say Trader Joe's, just say Trader Joe's, my I nigga. Don't I don't know nothing about that. I'm not, I'm, I don't want the smoke, Didi Delgado. All I'm saying though, is that niggas was selling old food. That's all I'm saying. Like their produce, was and they mark it up food. even though it's illegal. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. So here's the thing, folks. Listen, people create a rule, and motherfuckers find a way to get around the rule. Price gouging has a very specific uh, formula associated to it. Niggas want to know how much the box is. They want to know how much to donate right now, my nigga. Okay. <laughs> They're gonna say done for D, so you know it's from this podcast. So, box my nigga. The boxes will be $60. I'm charged the price. I'm charged the price. <laughs> box will be $60. And what we are doing is asking 25 people to buy boxes at full price. If they want to give more, that's great. But the bite, the boxes price is $60. And that will subsidize 25 boxes for other folks. Um, and the boxes will not just be produce. The boxes will also have value added food in there as well. Like we're doing proteins, we're doing, you know, we're doing oils, healthy oils, healthy fats, you know, we're doing cereals and grains. It will be like a box box. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that, so that is going to launch on May 29th. This is amazing. I'm about to do a box right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do two boxes. Cause I know you said something today and I've been thinking about it all day. My heart has been burning. Sometimes the shit you say, my heart like burns. Like I got acid reflux. You was like, you know, some, you were like, what is it that I do? Like, is it even worth it what I do here? And that shit pissed me off. And that's why I say my heart burns. Cause my nigga, you do shit that I wouldn't have dreamed of even doing. I had not dream of doing a lot of shit. Right. And you feed a niggas. I'm not, 
I made a breakfast once a month. Like, you know what I'm saying? You making boxes, you plucking the chickens, you massaging the eggs so that way they could taste tasty. You understand what I'm saying? Like you do it. Nobody massages eggs, but okay. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> you might be talking about some different eggs, girl. You might be getting some, some, you might be getting some different eggs, uh, massage girl. Well, I just want some massage. dick. I mean, that's really what I came here for. <laughs> so, that's really what I came here for. But no, I think about it in, in its totality. And I think about like all the work you do and $60 is nothing. When I went grocery shopping today on the Instacart for real, for real, I spent like $80 and on like paper plates paper you know napkins and forks and stuff like that whatever and apple slices are getting less for more during this pandemic my niggas like i'm just i'm trying to explain to you what you already know but like this is my lived experience i was like damn how did 80 dollars go out the door and we really didn't even buy food you understand what i'm right. saying like there was no protein w- whatsoever i bought today my groceries is actually still sitting on the floor because i'm waiting to put them away but um I, I want to say thank you. I'm definitely going to um, do what I said I was going to do. And I'm going to post a screenshot so that folks can be accountable and also do the same thing. What's 60 plus 60? 120. Thank yes. you. <laughs> okay. So every question, I mean, every show I ask this question, it's a two-prong question. The first part of the question is my favorite part. Knowing me. And knowing the gamut of all the things I could have talked about today, one, is there anything you're surprised about that I did not ask you or that you wanted yourself to come and talk about? And two, who would you like to see on a show? Um, no, we talked for two hours. I think we probably talked about some shit we shouldn't have talked about. Um, we both was drinking. And so tomorrow during the playback, we might actually be like, we need to edit this. I don't even watch these shits back, I'm telling you. I don't watch my lives back either. It's so weird to watch yourself back. All you do is just pull yourself apart. Um, so I don't think there was anything that I wanted you to ask me about. Um, um, and then the other part was who would I like to see on the show? Who would I like to see on the show? Hmm. Mm. Hmm. You got so many great guests already. That's so nice. I'm ready to pay my my dues to your fucking big GoFundMe right now. Uh, who, shit, who, who would I like to see on the show? Oh my God. Mm. Do you know... Um, the Muffin Man? No. <laughs> I want a muffin so bad with my fat ass. Blueberry <laughs> from Dunkin'. Blueberry Muffin! With, bu- with butter on it. What? With butter and a little bit of fucking raw honey, nigga. Ma'am, mm. we are not allowed to have this conversation. Okay. Um. Do you know a woman named um Oshun? I do not. She got a super fly African name, so I can't even remember the last name off the top of my head. But she is fucking amazing, and she's not someone who's right out in the forefront. She is. She does. She's not like a public speaker. She does a lot of writing on Facebook. I can okay. send you a profile, but I mean, girl, she, she's like a fucking, she like an AK-47 when it comes to receipts. She be like, rah! Like, when it comes to fucking black liberation for women, like right. liberation for black women and the receipts and the way she shows up and talks about the ways in which black men have historically harmed black women, Man, she's a fucking AK. She killing everything. She's Ooh. doing it. She's out here. Um, there's also Adrian Bate. She has a podcast called TT Talks. And she is a pediatric um, physical therapist. Um, and she's so fucking country in this like warm and enduring and loving way. Um, and she also is um, a, a EFA <laughs> practitioner. Um, and so I would love to see you. I'm trying to think of people who don't already have like super large platforms. I don't want to name the folks that like niggas already know, right? Because they got a million platforms. We're talking about folks that people need to be following because there's so much that they contribute that folks like don't know about. Um, there's also a woman named um Drake Shaw or Shaw Drake. She um 
teaches a workshop called Sugaring Without Sugar. She's mm, is that like a diabetes prevention workshop? No, it's like a sugar babies workshop. Oh, what's her name again? Shaw Drake. I'm going to ask Ada about it. I'm going to talk Ada in this. Super chocolatey, big tittied, fucking you know, mom, that's how I like it. mom of four, I think, now living in Mexico on her sugar daddy's, daddy's dimes. I feel like you're saying plural. I am saying plural. Um, homeschooling her children. It is an interesting mashup of like, radical black liberatory ideology and sex work right <laughs> like it it's kind of fascinating right. um, joy tabernacle do you know joy i don't know joy but joy i feel tabernacle like i want to learn joy and her husband michael battle um who okay. is a man of trans ex experience okay um and they are out in milwaukee um, I'm sorry, like they're, in they're in Pittsburgh, excuse me. Um, and they are hood homesteading. Um, and I believe they're doing some homeschooling. Um, and they're just dope as fuck. So I would like to see any of those people on your show. You know, it's interesting you say that because I've been talking about black homeschooling like a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the white moms that I know that I'm friends with are like, no, don't do that in any cost. And I think about just <laughs> like like what I mean by unschooling you know so I'm glad that you brought all this up and that you've like lifted it up I'm so grateful that I was able to sit down and have this conversation with you T like on so many levels I know that we can go for hours and hours and hours but I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart like you know I have a large heart anyways but I'm saying thank you from the bottom of my heart no for real this this shit has been like so I'm not even looking at the comments anymore. I'm just talking to you like person to person. Like the shit that you bring to the table, like niggas have just not been listening to. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and people hear you, but did you apply, right? It's the thing that I'm looking for. And so I just want to say thank you for being you unapologetically. I know like a, not, a, not a lot of niggas is you, but there are some people that like, pretend and you not you not for fake like you know what i'm saying like watching your live today reminded me like that whole shit that you pulled i'm not let me take this fucking earring off because it's actually heavy on my ear that whole shit that you pulled when you was like oh yeah like i'm i'm sad and i'm overwhelmed but like how black joy and yeah miss yolanda how you doing like i was <laughs> like this bitch is doing too much and also like i understand what you mean when you say people just assume you too much like you know what i'm saying so i just want to say thank you for being multifaceted in a space that wants you to be one-dimensional a 2d motherfucker you know what i'm saying and you out of this world and so thank you for that i appreciate it thank you thank you i got some salmon i need to put in my air fryer now baby go 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 this has been another episode of the full set i want all y'all to have a thank great you. day and we'll talk to y'all soon peace ciao bye